As promised, another Batman and Harley Quinn video. I've now watched this movie more times than I care to share, and let me tell you, it ain't no picnic. I would pay you to let me watch Mask of the Phantasm, but this was an ordeal. If you haven't seen our review video yet, check it out at the little card thingy that just popped up, or at the link in the description. Now, onto the Easter eggs. Batman and Harley Quinn is different from the other DC Animated Universe movies in many ways, but a big one is how stuffed it is with references, callbacks, and nods to its source material. It's been 11 years since the final episode of JLU, and 14 years since the last direct-to-video Batman the Animated Series movie, Mystery of the Batwoman. In that time, the animated series and the DCAU in general has become such a pop culture phenomenon that it would be almost impossible to make another installment without a constant flow of, hey, hey you, remember this? Yeah, I remember that. So let's just start from the top, shall we? In our opening shots, we see a division of Star Labs in Gotham City. We've never seen this specific building before, but we've certainly seen Star throughout Superman the Animated Series and a couple times on Justice League. In the Batman episode, Nothing to Fear, we actually have a reference to this Gotham Star Labs, but this is our first time actually seeing it. As we move inside, we get a look at the Floronic Man, originally a Silver Age Atom villain. In this movie, he's mentioned to be an exiled dryad from another dimension, which indeed was his original backstory when he debuted as the human turned swamp thing, but not Swamp Thing, Plant Master, in Adam Number 1, 1962. He didn't become the Floronic Man until 14 years later, in The Flash Number 245, in 1976. That's also the same amount of time between this movie and the last DCAU Batman movie. Coincidence? Yes. By the way, this is also Jason Woodrue. I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> That actor, John Glover, also played Lionel Luthor in Smallville and voiced Riddler on Batman the Animated Series. Time is cyclical! Poison Ivy returns for the first time on screen since Justice League's A Better World in November 2003, if you count her Justice Lords counterpart. And if you don't, then it's the first time since Static Shock's Hard as Nails in January 2003. Either way, it's been a while. Ivy's got greener skin here than we usually see, which leads me to believe she may be another plant clone, but we'll have to wait and see if we get any more answers in the sequel comic that's probably coming out soon, I think because it might have been this book that came with the Best Buy release, but I don't know because I somehow didn't know that was even a thing. How did I not know that was a thing? I'm me. If you heard me say plant clone and you have no clue what I mean, then check out our analysis of the original sneak peek for this movie from a few months back. I go into detail about it there and I don't want to waste any more of your time right now than I have to. While Poison Ivy is scouring the Star Labs files, there's all this Latin that roughly translates to absolute nonsense. This has to be just stuff they put into Google Translate and now I'm doing the reverse of that, so I'm sure this is not anywhere close, but there's some gems in here. Time is so soft. Over time, customer, supplier, the macro warm-up, but also to relax. No arrows, nor the present. I like this one. This must have to do with Steve Jobs. It didn't fully translate. Apple itself to invest hate sweaters. Developer, always a silly smile, was now mainstream taste soft. Propaganda football kids smartphone. Reserved quiver cartoon film. Development at kids to suspend a keyboard. A free outdoor soccer members of our fears. During the football upset, another teacher which runs a youth with the use and such an office. <laughs> Wait, hold up. Sorry, it's not worth reading. Just a bunch of free associating nonsense, not even slightly worth your time and effort, but that's the way it goes. Oh, <laughs> you guys. I'm gonna kill you. When she lands on her desired bit of info, we see written references to the Sunderland Corporation, which in comics land is a company run by General Avery Carlton Sunderland, who, as the story goes, hired Jason Woodrue to examine the lifeless body of a recently presumed dead Swamp Thing to discover the secret behind what makes Swampy tick. Good luck following what I just said at all. Based on the context in this paragraph, it seems safe to assume a similar situation occurred in the DCAU following Alec Holland's accidental transformation, as it's also referenced later in the movie that Floronic Man removed half a dozen of these tubers from Swamp Thing's corpse a few years ago while he was temporarily deceased. Holland's bio-restorative formula is mentioned here, and soon after brought up by Batman as we see the origin of Swamp Thing. Alec Holland himself appeared in Batman Adventures Volume 2, looking similar enough to how we see him here. In these issues, he's working alongside Pamela Isley, the real Pamela Isley. Again, if you don't get it, watch this. I don't want to explain it like 20 times. In a swamp in Bayou Country. Fortunately for my own sanity, this seems to line up just fine with his Louisiana laboratory explosion as far as location and timing goes, but it's unknown whether or not Pamela Isley was inside the lab with him. Interestingly, this is, to my knowledge, the first time we see usage of thumb drives in the DCAU. Even in Batman Beyond, everybody's got discs of some kind. I guess I'll just have to, like, <laughs> not care. We get an appearance by the iconic police blimps of BTAS 
Batmobile-esque fame, just as we pan down to the front door and... Is that the original Batmobile? Okay, not the original original, but I mean, like, the one from BTAS? Shouldn't he be using his later model at this point? I mean, he's still got it in the garage in Batman Beyond, but... No! Why? Why do you do this to me? A new bat suit? Really? It's like, mostly this one, but also kind of this one? Are these all different? Are these all the same, but viewed through a different lens? Why didn't they just use the Justice League one? We've never seen an animated Justice League Batman alongside his own supporting cast. This would have been the perfect opportunity! <sighs> Calm down, James. It's just a cartoon. Just take a deep breath and move on. Okay, so Nightwing has a new hairstyle. Come on! Why can you see his eyes now? <clears throat> Outside we see his night cycle to a classic new Batman Adventures vehicle. <laughs> Goes just fine with that new Batman Adventures Batmobile, wouldn't you say? During Batman's explanation of Swamp Thing's origin, we also get a quick glimpse at a wedding photo featuring a woman who is likely Linda Holland, who was Alec's wife in the comics and was murdered by the criminals who caused the explosion that set her husband's transformation into motion. In her youth, she studied under Jason Woodrow and was classmates with Pamela Isley. Isn't that neat? James, you do these videos for fun. Just keep reminding yourself of that. Okay. Batman and Nightwing discuss enlisting the help of Harley Quinn, to which Nightwing says, Last I heard, Harley went off the grid after she got out on parole. No one's heard a thing since. If you're looking at only the cartoons, then chronologically the last time we saw Harley on screen was in the Justice League episode Wild Cards, where the Joker was put into a comatose state by Ace of the Royal Flush Gang. Now that Joker's not exactly available, it's possible this pushed Harley to eventually quit the criminal life with her puttin' out of the picture. But that's a topic for the timeline video we're in the process of making. Ah, oh, jeez. I gotta make another video about this movie? The things I do for you people. On the trail of the green team, Batman makes a visit to Argus. We've never seen or heard of Argus in the DC CAU, but they've been around since 2012 in DC's New 52 line, and are a big part of the CW's Arrowverse. And honestly, it's kinda cool to see the DCAU incorporating elements from the comics that didn't even exist in its original run. In the New 52, Argus was founded by the American government after the formation of the Justice League, which in turn was founded to defeat an invasion by Darkseid. If we follow that thread, it's possible this DCAU Argus was formed after the events of Destroyer for a similar purpose as its comic book counterpart, to handle the aftermath of Justice League missions and deal with any smaller threats the League may not be able to focus on. On the other hand, the comic book Argus has more recently become under the control of Amanda Waller, who helmed the DCAU's Cadmus project, so its purpose is up in the air at this point. Also, maybe Argus is named after the Greek giant with a thousand eyes, because he could, like, see a lot of stuff, and so can Argus, because government? I don't know, count it. But they do seem to be happy and willing to work with Batman as Sarge Steel, we'll come back to him in a moment, recalls a recent event where Batman helped them out with that League of Assassins thing in Nanda Parbat. Nanda Parbat, of course, is seen in the Justice League Unlimited episode Dead Reckoning, home to a village of monks and the Master, one of Bruce Wayne's mentors and trainers in martial arts. That League of Assassins name drop, though, is puzzling. In the DCAU, Ra's al Ghul's organization is called the Society of Shadows, and the only other thing close to this is the Society of Assassins from Batman Beyond, of which Kurare is a member. But the League of Assassins is a name straight out of the comics, and I can only assume it was renamed Society of Shadows for the Batman cartoon because of censorship. Oh, make sure you don't say assassin! There are children watching this show! Now bring out the Tommy guns! It's likely then, I guess, that this is a new third group, led perhaps by Lady Shiva, a martial arts master in DC villainous who also gets a name drop in this same scene. So this guy, Sarge Steele, a Charlton Comics classic. He's been around since 1964 as a member of the CIA, Wonder Woman's Department of Metahuman Affairs boss, an agent of Checkmate, you name it. Shameless plug time! Checkmate is an organization currently featured in our original online webcomic Legacies of the DC Animated Universe. You can find the comic, which covers the time period between JLU and Batman Beyond, at the link in the description. Sarge Steele is also voiced by John DiMaggio, who, ironically, voiced voiced Bender on Futurama. <laughs> See, cause Sarge Steele has a metal hand, uh, like Bender. They, they both have metal hands. Please clap. In his conversation with Batman, we also get references to Metropolis, Gothcorp, and the NSA, the latter of which was the government agency constantly in hot pursuit of Zeta and Ro on the always forgotten DCAU series, The Zeta Project. I'm sorry, it's just so nice to even get a hint at this show. Meanwhile, Nightwing is wandering the streets looking for anything that could lead him to Harley Quinn. Among the people he asks is Father Michael Stromwell, who <laughs> appeared in the Batman the Animated Series episode It's Never Too Late, and is the brother of Gotham mob boss Arnold Stromwell, who <laughs> is the uncle of Tony Zuko, the gangster responsible for the deaths of Dick Grayson's parents. This man is on screen for like two seconds and it means so much. 
so much. Nightwing also comically questions this elderly couple who refer to a relative named Irene that supposedly looks like Harley Quinn. Is this just a random joke? I googled Irene Harley Quinn multiple times assuming I'd come up with a cosplayer or an actress that once played her in something, but does anyone know if this means anything? Am I overthinking this? Am I overthinking this whole movie? Oh my god. D do these videos even mean anything in the grand scheme? Am I just wasting my life? Does any of this matter? Why do I care about any of this? Why did I quit my job to make more of these videos? Why do I- He finally gets to this super babes place where, of course, he immediately finds her because he was just being Nightwing. Sexual hormones personified. Super babes itself seems to be a possible nod to the Planet Krypton restaurant from DC's 1996 epic Kingdom Come, which is also a superhero themed eatery where all the waiters dress like DC characters. Now inside, we have the honor, the privilege of seeing various overly sexualized versions of some of the DCAU's most notable female characters. We got Sexy Batgirl, Sexy Supergirl, Sexy Catwoman, Sexy Fire, Sexy Ice, Sexy Vixen, Sexy Mental Patient, Sexy 1900 Steel Conglomerate Tycoon, Sexy Sexy, and Frog. Oh my, Sexy Granny Goodness, now there's the full package. I'd like to check out her ex-pit. Giving to Granny. Hmm. I could have sworn there was more than just that. What? Starfire? I mean, cool? So that means Starfire exists in this universe? We know there's a Teen Titans. So where's Robin? With the Titans. And we know that Beast Boy probably exists. Hey, what about the kid in the Titans? Yeah, 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 the green one. So this isn't far-fetched, but geez, new information. Why can't we ever just see the friggin' DCAU Titans? There's also Power Girl. She even has a menu item named after her, but Huh? The only Power Girl-like character we've seen in the DCAU is Galatea in Justice League Unlimited, and she was theoretically murdered by Supergirl. Did this giant electric jolt mess with her brain, and now she's alive and actually a superhero? But why? Is she this Power Girl from the JLU comics? Wait, no, those aren't canon. Is this like a Hawkman thing? You know, how they put in Katar Hall after they already did a new spin on... Katar Hall. They had a cool original idea and then they just did the normal thing anyway. I- Ah! I guess there's Power Girl now! Just do whatever you want, Bruce Tim. Other than the waitresses, we get some other DC character cameos in Super Babes in the form of wall art, like Superman, Aquaman, Robin, Captain Marvel, Riddler, Wonder Woman, Flash, Joker, Supergirl again, Batgirl again, and other menu items named after Black Canary and Hawk Girl. And then... Then there's this guy, Green Lantern. But not just any Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. Why? Why, why, why? Our human DCAU Green Lanterns include Jon Stewart and Kyle Rayner. You had two options. Not this guy. This guy only appeared in a small cameo in JLU's The Once and Future Thing after the time stream had become so messed up that Hal took Jon's place for a few minutes. The main timeline's Hal Jordan was an Air Force pilot, and that's it. Wait, maybe. Maybe this movie takes place in that other timeline. The one Hal Jordan is from. That would explain the Power Girl thing. And any other mild inconsistency this movie has. Yes. Yes, that's it! No, wait. Batman made it so none of that ever happened. <sighs> You couldn't have just put Jon Stewart, buddy! These posters are all evocative of their comic book counterparts, especially in the visuals of Supergirl and Riddler. But don't go telling me Dick Grayson never looked like that in the DCAU, because you bet your ex-pit he did! Before we leave Super Babes, check this little gem out. This guy's sitting right here, and then a couple shots later, he's sitting over here. Good work, guys. Later, Harley leaves work and Nightwing follows her back to her rundown apartment, but not before Harley passes by a handful of recognizable faces on the street, like this biker who makes a prominent appearance in Growing Pains, but also once tried to hit on Maxima. It didn't work out well for him. There's also this biker who Green Lantern helps in Secret Origins, and uh... Oh, this guy back here who was part of the group of catcallers that once egged on Harley and Ivy a little too hard. Oh, and what are you gonna do? Spank us? <laughs> That's right, pigs! And here's the paddle! Whoa! In this next scene, Harley references Arkham Asylum and, after her scuffle with Nightwing, the Joker himself. Then Batman pulls out a cell phone and... Uh, again with the modern technology. The cell phones in Batman Beyond look like big clunky 90s bricks, but whatever. You know, just go from black and white TVs to iPhones in like less than a decade. That's fine. I don't care. Oh look, Bruce Wayne has a smartphone in the recent Harley Loves Joker comic too. Isn't that so great? Now we come to this scene, the one everyone seems to hate. Harley's closet is full of other Harley Quinn costumes, which no doubt is a nod to how many times the character's appearance has changed over the years. And this line... You say I'm a criminal. They say I'm a hua. Well, I'm sick of other people telling me what I am. Seems to be a very tongue-in-cheek slam on the modern DC fan community. Psst, maybe, um, 
maybe if the character is consistently written as a sex symbol, then that's what her character is, and you should stop being such a judgy McJudge pants. You know, I, for people who are outraged at, at seeing Harley being sexually aggressive and sexually active, I'm sorry, but they just haven't been paying attention. Harley makes reference to the time period when Nightwing had a mullet, which of course calls back to the new Batman adventures and Dick's unfortunate hairstyle throughout. This is the second time in a direct-to-video DCAU-ish movie where a character who previously rocked a neck warmer decided it was time for a trim. But why this look? In Batman Adventures Volume 2, Nightwing had already done away with the long hair but kept the 90s spikes. Though I guess he went back to the mullet for this JLU cameo. The guy can't make up his mind. SHAMELESS PLUG TIME! We make a dank reference to Nightwing's ever-changing hairstyle in the latest issue of our original online webcomic, Legacies of the DC Animated Universe. You can find the comic, which covers the time period between JLU and Batman Beyond, at the link in the description. As Harley crawls toward Nightwing, she makes a meta-reference to studying the real-world book Seduction of the Innocent, which <laughs> warns of comic books' negative impact on children and its influence toward a life of crime, and actually caused the Comics Code Authority censorship program to be put in place. The book condoned Batman and Robin for having a supposedly homosexual relationship, which was both inaccurate and immaterial. But Seduction of the Innocent was published in 1954, so there's no way the DCAU's version could include Batman and Robin. Aha! Thank you, O oh glorious Gordon Godfrey. And I quote, Some children who admire these over-pumped superheroes do poorly in school, quarrel with their siblings, and refuse to eat their vegetables. When the doc tells Pammy and Planto that they need swamp water from Louisiana, he mentions nearby Slaughter Swamp, which we've actually seen already on Justice League. It's the swamp that Cyrus Gold was thrown into by his double-crossing criminal comrades, which transformed him into Solomon Grundy. DC Comics swamps have a funny habit of turning people into weird Hulk zombies. So Batman walks in on his adopted son having a sexy tickle fight. <laughs> we've all been there. Then as they leave, Nightwing mocks Batman. Like you never made out with a super villain. Hey look, Batman's cape is missing. Batman jokes that Harley is his punishment for dropping out of med school. A sly nod to his father, a Dr. Thomas w Oh wait, I already did this bit. Harley tells Batman to take the Donenfeld Expressway, which is named after Harry Donenfeld, the owner of National Allied Publications in the 40s and 50s, which distributed action and detective comics, the books that originally debuted Superman and Batman, respectively. Alright, this video is getting pretty long, I gotta speed things up a bit. Bloodhaven. It's apparently 15 miles from Gotham, that's where Nightwing lives these days, it's where Verlet's Glamour Slam was, it's when we saw this Nightwing cameo. Okay, that's done. The henchman bar thing. Jesus. Okay, here we go. Enrique Algancho from You Scratch My Back. Captain Clown from The Last Laugh. Rhonda Duane from Heart of Steel. Maven from a couple Catwoman episodes. Nitro from Appointment in Crime Alley. Germs from Feet of Clay. Calendar Girls Chippendale Goons from Mean Seasons. Rhino of Muggsy and Rhino fame from most of Ventriloquist's appearances. Emmy Lou Brown from, <laughs> from Critters. I know what that is. Stop! Destroyers! I'm gonna cut- Rocco from various Joker episodes. Henshaw from those same Joker episodes. Jay, no. Raven, no. Lark, I, I don't know. Penguin girl person. Driller from POV. Lily and Violet from Eternal Youth. One of Mr. Freeze's Ice Maidens from Cold Comfort. Mo, Lair, and Kerr from Holiday Nights and Beware the Creeper. Candace from Two-Face and Bane. I mean, she was Rupert Thorne's girl. Th those are the names of the episodes. I tell you, sometimes the episode titles were just not very creative. Jane. Oh, right. Is that Ratso? Yeah, it's Ratso. He's from, uh, Read My Lips, that's it. He also once tried to hit on Maxima. Didn't work out well for him. The hell is Ubu doing here? You got a master to protect, bro! Singing 1971's Don't Pull Your Love or Min and Max from Two-Face, the person and the episode. Except they die at the end, maybe? And also Captain Clown should be as dead as an android can be. And, and Rhonda, too. Why are the rest of them out of jail, for that matter? How did they get their original clothes? What is this place? And last, these Catwoman goons, Felix and Leo. They were never in a Batman the Animated Series episode or the DCAU at all, but they were in the 60s Batman show. This guy even does the Batusi behind Batman. What a funny guy. Haha, <laughs> there's the classic don't look behind you bat punch. And then there's these other 16 people that I don't know who they are, please help me. Hanging on the telephone, Blondie, 1978. All right, Booster Gold, voiced by Bruce Timm, says funny things, mentions elongated man and Buona Beast, League members who we've already seen, but also Triumph, Bloodwind, and Black Condor, who we haven't seen and I'd like to see. He also mentions a christening in Aquaman's place. I guess it's for their son that's like four or five years old now, depending on when this movie is set. I'm gonna make a timeline video soonish. We can't be Aqua Girl, she's like a teenager in Batman Beyond. Does he have another kid? Why is this just glossed over? He says the League is out near Rigel. That's also where Green Lantern said he was in Secret Origins when Jean gathers them all in the first place. Nice to see you, not Hell Jordan. Nightwing is seen here with his infamous stick thingies. He's not had those before in the DCAU. This is important. Am I yelling enough? This is the first time we're seeing the green in the DCAU. It's halfway hinted at every time Poison Ivy does a plant thing, but here it's actually named and we see it in action. In DC mythos, the green is an elemental force which connects all plant life on Earth, opposite the red, which controls all animal life and is accessed by heroes like Buona Beast, Vixen, Beast Boy, because Beast Boy probably exists in this universe, right? There's also the clear for sea life, which is what Aquaman is theoretically using here, and the rot, which I guess Grundy is probably connected to in the DCAU, and some other colors I don't care. Look it up on your own. Moving on. 
Look, it's the Batwing, like the first one. Why? I mean, it's cool to see it again. It has red lights on it, though. Those weren't there before. I guess maybe it's like a nod to the Batman Beyond Batmobile because that's the next evolution, but this is the old one. Oh my God. Harley Quinn mentions Captain Kirk, which apparently in this universe is from the classic show Star Trek. She also mentions she had a cat and a hamster as a child, but sucked at taking care of them. Yet she's had two hyenas this whole time. They seem to be doing okay. The Adventures of Batman and Robin theme music plays here. Cool things I know. At the swamp in Louisiana, Harley says Ivy's traps will be like Little Shop of Horrors on steroids. That's a movie with a big evil plant in it. Get it? <laughs> she also mentions how dumb it would be to see Floronic Man in a trench coat and hat. You mean like Killer Croc? Batman uses this gun they call a Sonic Disruptor. It's like a small version of the big Sonic gun he has in Dark Knight Returns. Isn't that interesting? Then Swamp Thing shows up to do nothing. He's freaking huge. What's funny is that Bruce Tim has snuck Swamp Thing into the DCAU at least twice in the past, once here in initiation for one blink and you'll miss it shot. And also earlier on the third moon of Galtos in the Christmas episode of Justice League Comfort and Joy, it's nice to see him finally officially part of the DCAU, even if he did absolutely nothing. He does mention Gaia of Wonder Woman's exclamatory repertoire. Great Gaia. And he says he's gonna go hang out with the Parliament of Trees, which is the collective elemental hive mind that controls the green. They're literally a bunch of trees that look like old guys. What a great way to end this video. Oh, post credits. Harley's back in the public eye as a TV personality in her Harleen Quinzel persona that hasn't been seen since Mad Love. I was gonna make a comment about how her glasses don't have arms and that maybe it's a nod to the future of the DCAU where nobody's glasses have arms, but then I looked and they actually didn't originally either, so never mind. I just wasted an extra 10 seconds of your time. Time you'll never get back because you chose to watch this video instead of spending time with your family. I think that's it. If I miss something, I know you're gonna tell me, so I can't stop you, so go ahead, tell me. It's okay. I probably missed something, but holy hell, there was a lot of stuff in this movie. If you made it all the way through, congratulations. Your prize? One free visit to our Patreon page. You can check it out at the link in the description, where even the lowest $1 tier gets you 24 hours early access to our videos. You could have watched this yesterday, but you didn't, probably. Be sure to follow us on our social media as well, where we post DCAU news, artwork, reviews, and much more every single day. And again, don't forget to check out our review of Batman and Harley Quinn, which will be available in the form of a lovely clickable rectangle shortly. Thank you so much, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on other upcoming content from the Watchtower database. I did it, Ted! I finished the video!